Um, I was going to say the sunny south coast, but uh, that would be probably not telling the truth, not today anyway. Thanks very much for joining us this afternoon. Um, you're very welcome indeed. And I really hope that this afternoon's talk will take us away from uh, this time back to a time when at least you didn't need face coverings or social distancing and all the rest. And I'm sure that's what we're going to get. Um, now, it's my privilege this afternoon on behalf of the uh, Wessex and Dart branch to introduce our speaker this afternoon, Mr. Peter Lamb. And um, I've known Peter for the best part of 50 years. Um, that's probably since we were in short trousers, but uh, he may beg the difference to that. But um, Peter has been involved in many things over the years, and he's been very instrumental in the Wessex Dart branch committee. He's acted as our secretary for quite a few uh, occasions. Um, sadly, at the moment, he's not on our committee, but uh, we continue to work on him about that. But uh, it's my privilege to introduce him this afternoon. And uh, I know we're going to get a good talk. I've listened to Peter many times before. And uh, I'm now going to hand you over to Peter because many times in the past, he's actually um, operated the Dorset Bells, which uh, local people will be familiar with, but uh, more of that during his talk this afternoon. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Peter and he's going to talk punching the tide. So Peter, it's all over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, and good afternoon and welcome aboard for our little uh, tour this afternoon on the South Coast. Um, a lot of you all know, perhaps, that I lived, worked in the manic conditions of New Covent Garden Market for 20 years. I wonder why I ended up running boats from Bournemouth Pier, a complete change of direction. Well, to be honest with you, it's something I'd always wanted to do. Uh, as a quick view of where I worked at Covent Garden in the flower market. But I was born in Southampton, and this is taken Southampton just in the early 50s, the time that I was very first as a small child involved and interested in the ships. You had things like the Union Castle boats, you got know, the new ocean terminal there. And mainly, and probably of more interest to me, was all, were all the little boats, the little railway ships, etc. And these two uh, tug tenders, these were the ships that always interested me. You see the Queen Mary in the background there. But it's quite easy to walk around the docks in those days and you could get lifts on the tenders down to the Mother Bank and Cows Roads when visiting lines came. And, uh, but of more interest was the, the railway area around the, the Southern Railway workshops and these smaller docks. Here we see a quartet of the Denny ships there. You've got the Fillets, the Dinard, the Ride and the Car Ferry Lymington, all in for re winter refits. They spent hours there. I have to admit these photographs aren't mine, but I was too young to take photographs. Uh, here's the Whippingham in dry dock, the large paddle steamer that operated primarily between Portsmouth and Ride. You see her bow rudder there, which uh, assisted her getting in and out of the Portsmouth Harbour. Uh, I only went on the uh, Whippingham on one occasion on the last year, and that was only while she was in dry dock having a refit like this. Had a look around, which there was no security and nobody worried what you did and what you didn't do, and you, it was quite easy to look at. But um, then we move on, and I'll take you very briefly on a trip across the River Itchen at Southampton on a steam floating bridge, because just across the river was a, a very interesting shipyard called John I. Thornycroft's. And Thornycroft's have built a variety of ships over the years, numbered for Red Funnel, etc. Well, over there, just before the war, there was a, a Yorkshire lass and, uh, called Gracie Fields, and she was down to launch her ship. Uh, they called the Gracie Fields, which was, uh, as they launched at Wollstone, had a very short career and sadly ended up being sunk at Dunkirk, during the bravery of the Dunkirk evacuation. Here's a little film of her uh, launching the ship. Take a minute or two just to load up. Hey, gracious, it's Gracie Fields. Fancy seeing Gracie girl at Southampton, doing out so grand as launching steamer. 
He looks like she means business. All you do is, to, as soon as I pull the pin out... Well, I've got, I've got used to doing a bit of that, didn't I? <laughs> When Southerners get to naming ship after our Gracie, that's tribute to Lancashire. So give it to them, lass. Name her. Gracie Fields. Goes to sea. <laughs> that there was Gracie's top note drowning all the sirens. And it's bang right up to mark. And all the folk join Gracie in chorus. It don't happen every day that a southern paddle steamer gets a slap up send off like this here. And then we move on, of course, to the Balmoral that was uh, launched by Thorny Cross in 1949. And as a child in Southampton, she was the boat we used to take for trips to leafy places such as Sandown, Shanklin, and Ventnor. There's a, a, a rather nice view of her in the red funnel colours, quite a well known image, but I thought it. it, it put it into the theme of things. However, it was holidays in Bournemouth that really tickled my fancy. My grandmother lived in Bournemouth and I used to uh, have holidays there each summer. And my time was running up and down the pier watching the comings and goings of the Cousins steamers. Sadly, I couldn't uh, really remember the Emperor of India. And when they went, the period I remember was the monarch seen here and people going out and of course they had very little covered accommodation. You can't really imagine people going out on a day like that today. And the embassy, which is seen here thumping up Southampton water. And they had, of course, their delightful consul that used to come up to Bournemouth from Weymouth two or three times a month, a week, sorry. And I used to spend a lot of time on the pier watching the comings and goings. And when she arrived, it was always a must to go and see her. Now, just to the east of Bournemouth pier, there was a place called Bolson's Jetty. And Bolson was a family now of Bournemouth fishermen. And uh, as Bournemouth was developing in tourism and the paddle steamers were very busy, Mr. Bolson saw a great opportunity to move up from operating rowing boats to operating small Skylark, as he called them, open launches on short trips. The paddle steamers took you away for a day or to Swanage. These picked up the 30 minute trips around the bay, etc. It became very successful. He developed his fleet and gradually expanded the duration of the journeys. And at one stage, he picked up the option. It was caused by the fire on Brancy Island. Brancy Island, Paul Harbour, was a major fire. And in the 1930s, and people, strange people like to go and look at these things. So there was a demand, so he started taking people there. But on the longer trips, he realized there was a need for people to use the toilet. And uh, he, did, of course, didn't have toilets. So what he did, he built these little portable sort of built-in loos on the side of the ship. And I've often wondered how it would be to see some poor old granny struggling to go in there backwards, all the boats bobbling around going through the East Loo Channel. But anyway, that's how the business developed. This is the business I became involved with much later down the line, as we shall see. This is Bournemouth Pier taken in 1935. Those of you who are familiar with Bournemouth, this is where the pier baths were built. And here we see the Empress of the Monarch from Cousins and Company. They still had what we call the banjo berth around the pier here. Pier head where smaller boats could land. And this was Bolson's jetty and you see four of the Skylarks sitting there. And we move on to the next one, which is the Titlark, which was a development of the Skylarks, a much better boat. There's an inside toilet, bar, saloon, and again, primarily doing trips around the bay or over to Studland, etc. 1937, two years down, you see his jetty here with the, he's got two titlarks there now. Bournemouth baths have opened there. And at the pier, you see the Bournemouth Queen Monitor on the mark. Bournemouth was then coming to its sort of pre war zenith. People were coming from all over the country, large numbers, and tended to stay, come year after year after year. They'd book out the guest house one day, and they knew when their holiday would be the next year, because the factory was on holiday, and they'd rebook for the following year. And this is the type of holiday maker we used to have in profusion, before I was born, of course. And it's interesting, this gentleman's got his long johns on, thick socks, a hat, a, a hanky on his head, and his detachable collar. And they were just working class folk who would come down, always looking for something to do. And the short cruises that Bolson's offered were actually often within their price range and very popular. 
This is queuing for the Emperor of India in 1937, Cousins Paddle Steamer. My family are in this, they're down in this section here. And uh, the cruise was to go to the Spithead Coronation Naval Review, evening illuminations. Well, the old Emperor of India set off and the fog descended and they didn't see any illuminations and they didn't get back till three in the morning frozen. And my mother related tales of this until her dying day, saying I'd never do that again. After the war, Bolson's invested in some new builds. By this time, they had a very uh, dynamic shipyard business in Poole. During the war, they were the largest employer of people. They had ran that were building from three locations in Poole. And at one time, were building a landing craft every day. So they, their uh, contribution to the war effort was very considerable. And they had all the skills and expertise now to build boats. And uh, they produced the delightful little Poole Bell and Bournemouth Bell. Trade was so good that when two ex Fairmile bees came along, the wartime Fairmile bees, the opportunity arose to buy them and they bought the Dunkirk and the Matapan. This is the Matapan in later years when she was renamed Pool Bell. Now these boats, when you traveled, uh, when you saw them going along, they had a knife edge bow and they were going at speed and they were ex warships and it was for a small boy ever magical. And you thought they were creaming through the waves at a massive speed. In fact, when you're on there, you, 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 the sedate 10 or 11 knots was more apparent. But they were a delight to go on wonderful uh, workhorses for the company, but of course, very limited covered accommodation, very much a, a sunny day boat. And this is the Dunkirk, the sister ship, when she was actually operating for another company off Brighton. And my first cruise was through the mystical sounding Dorset Lakes which in fact is an area around the back of Poole Harbour. Uh, Poole, of course, is the second largest natural harbour in the world and cruises uh, around the islands there became known as cruising through the Dorset Lakes. The 1960s dawned with Bournemouth and Challenges, Britain's premier holiday resort. Seven and a half miles of golden sands, an agreeably temperate climate with below average rainfall, the rolling hills of Dorset to the west and the new forest to the east, 105,000 deck chairs, Bed stock of 53,000, the greatest number of UK four star rated hotels outside of London, unrivaled holiday, uh, high quality retail experience likened to Bond Street, four theatres with top quality summer season entertainment, 11 cinemas, ice skating, swimming pools, and wonderful restaurants, two well appointed piers, and a comprehensive programme of pleasure boat cruises. What could change? Well, actually, everything. You could sell in the 1960s, go and see Dick Emery twice a night on Bournemouth Pier, if you so desire. And Bournemouth Pier had this lovely uh, purpose-built theatre, which was opened in 1960. 850 theatre seats. And uh, they also had four shows a day, so they had two children's shows each day. So you could, if on a wet day, you could go along there in the daytime with the children, and also go back and see old Dick in the evening. This is a scene of Bournemouth in the 60s. And all the rowing boats were actually owned by the Bolson family as well, uh, the different branch of the family, and they retained ownership of those right the way through. And you see Bolson's jetty here with one of the white bells alongside. Changing social standards. You look here and you don't see one piece of litter. If you come to Bournemouth now, you're lucky to see a piece of sand. Uh, the Bournemouth skyline in 1961. This is, if anybody familiar with Bournemouth now, it's all high rise all the way down here. And but this is a serene scene looking down on Bolson's jetty was still there. The pier that had been breached during the war was fully restored and looking very smart with a theatre, restaurant and everything on there. And you had a bit of light relief occasionally. These are the Tiller girls, the dancing troupe from London who were in the summer show at the Pavilion Theatre, came down for a photo shoot and uh, attracted all the boys' eyes, I'm sure. Anyway, the good old days that couldn't last forever. Here we see a balmy June morning in 1963. Captain John Eyliff, the cousin's last skipper on the bridge wing of the embassy, overseeing the embarkation of a healthy crowd of passengers uh, for destined for Tottenham Bay, Isle of Wight. You'll see here, the crew are actually distributing deck chairs. So it was obviously going to be a good day. Uh, ahead of embassies, one of Bolson's. Bolson's by this time had, uh, created two companies, Bolson owned the shipyards and Croson, they called another business, Croson ran the boats. The idea being it was an accounting business that one couldn't pull the other one down. If one failed, the other would survive, etc., etc. 
And uh, we're very close to the game because uh, one of the directors was a chap called Bing Crosby, and the other one was Olsen, they an album the name to Crosons. Anyway, the Swanage Bell they negotiated alongside the pier to take the Swanage service. And here we see the Matterplan alongside the pier with the Bolson rowing boats. This is a typical Bournemouth scene at the time. Busy beaches, yellow buses as were in those days, ice cream out there, and just a, just a good beach. Sad days, Wayne Harbour 1967, the embassy awaits her fate. Having moved through the town bridge, she lies alongside Custom House Key Weymouth. A sad farewell to Bournemouth's last paddle steamer, or so we thought. The changing social scene. Bournemouth Pier in the 1960s, it had the theatre with four shows a day. Actually on the pier, there were 5,000 deck chairs, speedboat thrill rides, a quality restaurant, sea fishing trips, free deck games, comprehensive programme of boat cruises. Bournemouth Pier last year had a cafe, a zip wire, an indoor climbing frame, and latterly, the return of the Dorset Vale, more we shall hear about later. When the embassy left, the company tried to plug the gap for the lucrative Isle of Wight trade. They tried to buy the Coronia from Scarborough, which was not available, so they were able to uh, purchase the Thornwick, which came down here from uh, Bridlington. You know, we see the Thornwick case as was, and Bolson's rebuilt her and made her look very smart. Unfortunately, her undercover accommodation was very limited. She was slow and she rolled rather excessively and was not a, a, a good uh, replacement for the embassy. And the following year, they managed to get the delightful Coronia and renamed her Bournemouth Queen. And uh, she was a really excellent boat, the class three certificate. And of course, she was known later on in, for her helping out the Waverley up on the Clyde as the Queen of Scots when the Waverley had the misfortune to ground uh, many years ago. Here she is setting off to the Isle of Wight. And a, a couple of people tried to run a hovercraft from Bournemouth. It was totally unsuccessful. Bournemouth swell and loading people on and off. It was just a, not a satisfactory thing to do. But everything running from Bournemouth or operating from Bournemouth is subject to the weather. That's always in the back of your mind, the weather and the sea conditions. And the company invested in some new tonnage. In 1974, at their own yard. Well, in fact, it wasn't at their own yard. Their own yard was too busy to build it. But at another yard, they designed and they built the Dorset Bell, but fitted her out back at their own yard. And uh, she was a twin uh, Chatel drive. So multi-directional drive, so it could hold her into the pier and cope with the swell conditions when you're loading and unloading passengers and stop that uh, the swell pushing her up and up and down the pier is, is so common. And the following year, there's the Bournemouth Bell. In 1975, she was built to replace the Bournemouth Queen. Uh, the Bournemouth Queen, uh, we've been involved in as the Paddle Steamer Society. We chartered her on a couple of occasions. And during that time, I got to know Mr. Crosby. And shortly afterwards, I got to know Mr. Bolson. And we sort of kept in touch. Right? If I came down, I'd pop my head around the door and say hello. And a time went on and I said to him, if ever you're sort of thinking of retiring, you know, I've something I've always wanted to do, not realising quite what I was having myself in for. But uh, so that's where the, the connection arose. And the remaining fair mile, the Pool Bell ex Matapan, she lasted through the incredibly warm summer of 1976. And on days like this, she'd make the company a fortune, but of course on cold, wet days, she wouldn't take a shilling. And uh, she was wooden, built during the war for a short spell, and then, of course, uh, rebuild costs and refitting were excessive. And the company took the very bold step, step to build the pool bow, which became the flagship of the ship, an improvement over the earlier Bournemouth and Dorset bow. She had a better covered accommodation like bar area and quite a deck, uh, air covered deck area, as well as a comfortable saloon. Here she is arriving uh, at Yarmouth. They used them, the Bolsons used them on all sorts of occasions when, the, when opportunities arose. Here we see uh, alongside HMS Olna coming back from the Falkland Islands when the Falkland fleet came back. A very well loaded pool bow went up to Southampton water and so to welcome them back. 
And later on, we see her in Portsmouth Harbour in the company of the Solent scene there on the right. And uh, this was to welcome HMS Bristol back. And she had a certificate then for 250, and it looks like all 250 were crammed on the small open areas. And somebody, the little joker, sat on top there. That wouldn't be, that would be frowned upon today. The company tried to get into Boston Pier. There's a very grainy image, the only image we've got of that. They had birthing trials at Boston Pier. And uh, at one stage, they did tend to operate there, but in fact, uh, nothing ever became of it. So their primary operations were linking Bournemouth, Swanage, Poole, and the Isle of Wight. The Isle of Wight was the jewel in the crown at that time, but uh, tastes change. Sand, sand, and more sand. That's the story of Bournemouth. 50 years ago, Bournemouth Council embarked upon an ongoing program of beach renourishment. Now, this was the wall down here. This is actually my wife and my mother. And this is looking the other way today. That's where the sand is today at the top of the wall. You'll see how much sand's been flipped. And of course, that's dumped tons of sand around the pier. And this is actually a summer storm in 1968. And uh, it just shows how bad the beach had eroded and why there was some need to do some work. But it seems to have gone on perhaps a little excessively. And this is how it is now, after a blow now, a summer blow, it's all up over the promenade, the sand, and this girl is determined to sit on the seat, whether she could or not. Interesting photo here taken in the 70s. You've got Bournemouth International Centre just finished and the swimming baths are still there, which were destroyed soon afterwards. But the wave line is the thing of interest. You see the wave line running along there. Well, I think if you're true to say no, the wave line is more here. So you see how it's shown. In fact, Bournemouth has become a well-known surfing resort. When I was a child, you'd never heard of a surfboard. Now on a winter's day, people in their wetsuits, you can have two or 300 people surfing in because the, of the change of the seabed. It's very, very shallow all the way out, as we'll see more. Anyway, in 1993, Richard Bolson retired and I took up the option in the company of a chap called Kevin Waters, who was a local boatmaster and some Paddle Steamer Preservation Society members who supported. And we bought the business. There was Richard Bolson, late Richard Bolson, sadly he passed away not too long after this. And his good lady Nestor's also passed away. And we took over new broom sweeps clean, uh, or we, so we hoped. And here we are. And this is actually flying the Cunard flag as well, as we went up to Southampton for a special event involving the QE2. Just to demonstrate, we used the logo now, the Dorset Bells. We thought um, the name Croson was, didn't represent really what we were doing, didn't mean anything to anybody. And perhaps Dorset Bells did, and I think uh, in truth it did. One area the company had never managed to get into was Brown Sea Island. We approached the National Trust with a view to operating a service from Bournemouth and latterly from Swanage. Initially it was turned down but a, a visit to the National Trust headquarters in uh, Warminster proved fruitful and we were Understandably so, I think the operators in Poole were trying to stop us, which I can see this is business. They thought every passenger we took would be one less that they would take, but in fact we were never a a threat to them in any, any form. There we see the Dorset Bell in at the pier. Right, the Dorset Bell, when uh, many years before the Swanage Pier had gone into disrepair and the Swanage service had closed as a result and the company had a spare ship. The spare ship was the Dorset Bell, which they originally chartered off and then sold off for service in the Isle of Wight. It changed hands again and it was taken over by uh, White Line Cruises, who were owned by Mark Raymond and his family, still are today. And uh, anyway, to cut a long story short, there was a Swanage Pier had been reopened. There was once again possibly an opening for a third boat, and we were able to negotiate and buy the Dorset Bell back. She has a habit of, sort of going and coming, but anyway, she's back again. And uh, there was a quick lick of paint, she was put into service, and always a popular boat. She was always a more suited boat because of her design for Brown Sea Island and Pool. Uh, she wasn't. She, she was a bit of a wet boat, if you want a rough sea, you can get rather wet in the bows and things. And her design didn't really lend itself to 
going to Swanage on a regular basis, though she did, of course, go there from time to time. Anyway, when we got going at Swanage, we were able to offer a very comprehensive service and, uh, and numbers from Swanage gradually built up. And it, uh, it was it's one of the, of course, major points. We were operated with the linking uh, with the steam railway when the steam railway was doing well. We were able to operate up to Corfe Castle by steam train, which is very popular. And uh, Swanage has never been there. It's one of those beautiful unchanged places where life sort of stood still, really. You still, still have fish and chips with the feet dangling over the edge of the quay and uh, lovely old tea rooms and things. Well worth a visit on a summer's day. Bournemouth here today, a far cry from 5,000 deck chairs, uh, half a dozen deck chairs, a few people strolling up and down, not the vibrancy it once enjoyed. And interestingly, you see the people there are sort of wading out towards the pier. <laughs> There's a brief uh, route map of what we tried to achieve. This is one of the, the later maps because we were involved with a speedboat called the Shockway, which I'll tell you later. And for artistic license, we moved the Isle of Wight near Bournemouth to get it on the map. But we used to go to the Isle of Wight at one time when I first started six times a week. And the demand for that gradually dwindled and dwindled. Good day at the pier, come alongside, so we'd set up in the morning. Long day is always at the pier. I used to get down there sometime in the summer around six in the morning, and it sounded crazy, but we had a lot of answer phone messages and emails to deal with, and faxes in those days. And once you'd opened for business, you didn't have time to deal with these. So the answer was to get down and deal with all this first thing, all the inquiries you could. And if there's a list of people on the answer phone, you couldn't phone them at six in the morning, you made the list, put on your desk, and you could pick them up as and when you could. Because once you started, you're up and down the pier and the lady in the office was dealing with non-stop phone calls. Interestingly, one day I went down onto the jetty, a day like this, strangely, and there were some police divers down there, the Metropolitan Police Divers. And uh, being a bit nosy, I asked them what they were doing and uh, they were looking for body parts. Uh, a, a gangster from London had been chopped up and thrown over in the sea over by old Harry Rocks. And they'd calculated with the current that it was, he was going to be washed up on each East Beach at Bournemouth. But um, they, there's also a large football freight football going out under Bournemouth Pier, goes out and then slightly to the east. And it's above the seabed, and they thought body parts might have got stuck under this. Anyway, that was the story they told me. I never really, whether I believed it or whether I didn't, whether they were looking for something else. I don't know if they found anything, but after lunch, they packed up and went back to London. It's our pool uh, base, the Dorset Bell alongside there. Pool is a, was, as a boy, pool was very much a working port. It's been developed over the years and it's quite a, a resort place to visit now. A lot of the attractions have changed, sadly some have gone, but uh, the quay is always a major attraction. And uh, it's a, the beauty of it is you can sail at all states of the tide and at all weathers. Had some unusual inquiries. The uh, Fort Victoria phoned the office one day and asked if we could take a, a thousand uh, cut sliced white bread for them. And uh, they were setting off on some long mission and the freezer was empty and they whacked a thousand loaves in there. My wife spent the afternoon negotiating with all the local bakers and the place called Fern Down. She found a bloke and managed to knock him down to 17 pence a loaf. Uh, we sold them to them or the Navy at uh, Tesco's prices, and nobody queried it. So that's the way things go, I suppose. I see some strange things on the pier. This chap, her husband was fishing, but uh, she wanted to take her laptop <laughs> and was determined to what, do whatever she was going to do. Here we see the pool bow. It's taken from the bow moral all the way, but it's taken from the way from the bow moral, I think, coming up past Hurst on her way to the other way. Not the way, but it's taken from. Yeah, Yarmouth was our primary landing point as uh, discharging passengers at Yarmouth Pier. 
And the early times when this was taken, when the pool bar was fairly new, she had a capacity for 250 passengers. And uh, she, this was, we reduced this to 216 later with 250 anyway, it was very uncomfortable. But this tied up with the number of man overboard life rafts she carried. And here she is sailing away from Yarmouth Pier. Well, of course, one of the white link ferries, the older white link ferries, leave this there. There's the Waverley coming in, she's pulling off the berth to let the Waverley in. And uh, often when moved up from the pier, because the pier was busy, and you felt to move up to the shelter of Yarmouth Harbour, known as that area, known as the hailing station. Sometimes we went to anchor off, off the pier, and the buoy was known as the pool bow. Uh, it's one of the challenges running for Bournemouth, party political conferences. They were a bit of a nightmare for us. The uh, hotels were full of delegates who didn't want to go on boat trips, or the press, or security people. And uh, those who were on holiday were a bit put off by having their bags searched as they went on the pier and having the police boat clamber aboard, the police off the police boat when we came in, because if we picked any passengers up in Stormage or Pool, they were regarded as potential terrorists. <laughs> Even old ladies who could hardly walk around being frisked, and it was, I suppose, people just doing their job. But it didn't do us any favors, and we had large party political broadcasts, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, conferences most uh, summers. The police were there keeping an eye on things. The massive police presence, even the drains were sealed over with wax, so it was like a sealing wax. So if anybody broke into a drain to put a bomb in, they could see the, uh, the joint had been broken. Then uh, up here we moved to Bridlington. Have a look here. Uh, our bank manager, Chris Wood, was aware that um, I was looking to perhaps procure another boat with a view to developing a service between Pool and Swanage. And we were looking at a sort of traditional boat and trying, the, and the, the Flamborium came on the market, to cut a long story short, and she was, uh, a book. we went up, had a look at her. She'd uh, be, just been served by the MCA and had a ticket and everything. And we saw the uh, Mrs. Keneally up there, we bought the boat from and brought her back to Pool. This is a short, but just showing she had a very rough passage in this mid summer coming down. Coming down the east coast was all right. As soon as she moved into the channel, she hit her nose into a, a summer storm. And obviously, no boats were running from the pier, but she made a token we could pass of the pier before going on to the pool. conditions uh, rather typical form of when it gets a bit of a storm in the summer. After a very brief stop, she set off for the shelter waters of the pool. Here she is coming into pool. 
first visit to Poole. Tranquil conditions, quite a contrast to Poole. And she's on one of her rare visits to Bournemouth Pier. She deputed us to pool bar one day going to the Isle of Wight. And coming back, it was certainly a rolling afternoon. And it was a very strange thing. When she came from Bridlington, uh, she had a musician and he came with her. <laughs> we sort of inherited him. And uh, when these poor people were sat in the saloon and the boat was rather, rolling rather vigorously, he was singing a rendition of Yellow Submarine, I remember, which I don't think was, went down too well. Uh, big hotels in Bournemouth were falling away like dominoes. Uh, we had a lady go around with leaflets every year and she'd come back every year and say, well, that's gone, that's gone, that's gone. And it was just a very fast decline. And one or two enterprising coach companies bought hotels, probably bought them for a pound for their debts, I suspect. And uh, one of these was Dacia's coaches who took over the 100 bedroom Sands Hotel up on the West Cliff. Uh, having seen that, I thought, well, I, go and, I spoke to Dacia's and they said, yeah, come along see us. And I gave a little presentation to them of all the things we could offer in terms of we could give discounts to their passengers and do this, that and the other. Or we could take them to Swans and they come back on one of their coaches, something like this. But halfway through, it was apparent they weren't in the least bit interested in it. And I don't blame them. It's uh, business is business. They were just interested in keeping the, the people under their wing all the time. They wouldn't come out the hotels at night. They they stay in and have a drink, however bad the cabaret, they still stay in there. And they, all the days out were arranged by them, which of course they, they made money on, which I so um, can't blame them for that. But it's a significant change. And fewer and fewer people came for evening cruises because of this. Hotels are all very much the same now. Only when I first started, we could have fill up the boat for an evening cruise. It's glorious across the Jurassic Coast, see the sun setting over the Purbex, so it's beautiful. But uh, towards the end, you're talking about 40 or 50 was a good, good evening. Anyway, attempt to accommodate the demands of the ever-changing tourist industry. As I say, frequency to the Isle of Wight, we came, broke down to three times a week. And when we were at the Isle of Wight, we offered obviously time ashore at Yarmouth. Unfortunately, there's not a lot to do in Yarmouth. If you just go to Yarmouth, Aaron there's probably hour or two is enough. We did a vintage coach tour around the West White villages. And that was uh, using John Woodham's coach and Derek Gorn, who a lot of you all know was a person on the waiver in the Balmoral. He was more often not the driver. A cruise to the Needles and a sailing on the Beauty River landing at Butler's Hard. Well, that was a new thing we introduced to try and do something different. But it was a very difficult thing to sell. Trying to talk to somebody from Yorkshire, a granny from Yorkshire, who couldn't even, no disrespect to her, didn't know how to even say Bewley. They just came and said, there's Bewley Ilu, where's this place? trying to explain to them what it was and what Butler's Hard was. If it said we we're going to somewhere like uh, Portsmouth Dockyard, they would realise that Butler's Hard was where a lot of uh, the old naval warships were built, the wooden walls with the timber from a new forest. And some of, um, uh, it's a very interesting historic place and some of Nelson ships were built there as well. Anyway, other primary sailings we could offer still were Brancy Island from Bournemouth and Swanage, optional steam train linked to Corfe Castle, one hour cruises we did to Sandbanks and Poole Harbour, cruises through the Dorset Lakes, which as I said, around the islands of Poole Harbour, Jurassic Heritage Coast cruises, nightly evening cruises, firework cruises, which were up to four evenings a week, and trips to witness major maritime events in the Solent or at Southampton. It was obvious we could no longer reply, um, rely upon casual sales, and I spent the winters lobbying coach companies, tour operators, English language school party organisers resulting in 100 to 150 pre-booked charter cruises and 250 to 300 party bookings. That was before the start of each season. It's essential we had these in the book, because as I say, uh, but you, again, everything was dependent upon the weather and the sea conditions. The swell conditions were getting ever worse at Bournemouth, the more shallow it became. And it was, uh, as uh, you'll see later, things became quite difficult. Every attempt was made to work with the Waverley. Here she is at the pier. We became uh, ticket agents for the Waverley. And uh, one day off she went, I think she was going around the Isle of Wight, Weymouth, around the Isle of Wight. And I had a phone call with Jim McFadge, the uh, presser. I'm sure a lot of people know him or will remember him. 
And I said, oh, hi, Jim. I said, oh, he says, lovely, beautiful round, absolutely wonderful. I said, oh, good. He said, your people are enjoying it as well. I said, well, oh. he said, we've got some people on here to book for a round the bay trip. We've got on the round the Isle of Wight boat by mistake. Uh, <laughs> so these are the sort of things one had to deal with. Fortunately, he was very helpful as always, Jim. He said, well, we'll keep them on here. But what they're more concerned about is the coach going to take them back to Weymouth. They came up from Weymouth on a coach. So he gave me all the details of where I'd find the coach. And uh, about half past four when the coach was due to go, I had to go up the town and look for this coach and explain to the coach driver that these people weren't coming and he'd gone back to Weymouth. And Jim very kindly got these people organised and they had a coach going back to Weymouth from Bournemouth to Waverley and they put these people on the coach and I think they probably gave them a bite to eat on board as well. Very helpful and it worked very well and there was no comeback on that at all. Busy days. On a good day, it's not unusual to register a thousand plus passenger journeys. On the left is actually, a, I picked this out, is the Bournemouth Air Show Day. We can see what the beach can look like at Bournemouth on crazy days. And the queue going down the pier here. This is also a bit of a cheat because this queue was for the Balmoral, where I'm taking the photograph from, the Balmoral's alongside. You can actually see one of the bow ropes going up there. And uh, she was going on a trip from Bournemouth down to, I believe, Dartmouth that day. It was one of those long, long runs down the coast. Beautiful trips we used to do. The pool bell there waiting alongside to load of passengers wherever she might be going. There's the three boats, but on a day like the one where the three are coming in, wonderful. But then you get these storms in the summer, which you do get, and you see where the surf runs right the length of the pier almost now. And of course, not only did you not take any money, but you lost money for the bookings you may have had pre-booked through the winter. So it, uh, it was a bad situation. And it seemed increasingly the winds became stronger in the afternoons as time went on, strange enough. We had more trips back from the Isle of Wight in challenging times than we did when I started. There's the pool bell picking up a bit of swell off the end of the pier. It's, people get frightened in those, there's not any danger or anything, and understandably, if they've been on a boat, they get a bit frightened about things. Some of the advertising, illustrating all the places we used to go. So all had to be done every year and read boards and everything. Always lots to do. I brought this in as the Cox family. Firstly on the left is Bernard Cox. Bernard Cox was a founder member of the Paddle Steamer Society. And he and his wife were very kind. He was a young lad and used to, if we're going anywhere interesting, he used to say, hop in the car, Pete, we'll take you here, there, and everywhere. And one of the little lads who was in the car with us was Chuck with Mark Cox, his son, and there's Mark on the right. Quite remarkably, Mark joined as general manager. He was a highly skilled engineer, and he gave his all to the boat of operation without his unflinching support to my many ambitious and at times crazy schemes. We would never have survived as long as we did. He was a top bloke. They tried all sorts of things. This gentleman was a retired colonel from the uh, army, a uh, major, sorry, I don't just this justice. And uh, he was also a tour guide of Bournemouth, and we did a thing called Walk, Walk and Waves. He had a tour of a walking tour of Bournemouth in the morning, and uh, a Chinese meal at lunchtime, a Chinese buffet meal, and a trip around the bay or over Swanage or something in the afternoon, all for about 15 quid. And he attracted quite a few coach parties. It was a very interesting, nice thing. Though sometimes I believe that people would rather have had the walk after the waves than before the waves, but uh, it worked very well. Sadly, he's now passed on. A good view of Dorset Bell, outward bound from the pier. That was taken from the Waverley. Right, we used to go along the Jurassic Heritage Coach. This is doing bird watching cruises to the Puffing Colony at Winspit. We had a guide on board from the RSPB and he tells us all about the boat. Very popular trips. If ever we were going what we call round the back, which is to the south of Swanage Pier, around the, uh, along the coast there. We used to ask the then Swanage Pier Master, Russ Johnson, to run up the hill and look over and see what the conditions were. And he was very good at this. He went up and he'd say, yeah, you're right tonight. Oh, don't go around another long swell tonight. Don't go around there. So that was helpful. But we did get it wrong once. We went round there and I was aboard. And once we got round the back, we went into this long swell of deep troughs. 
and the boat was fine, there's no problem. But we had a lot of people on board and we were concerned they'd get very nervous. But turning the boat round was going to be the problem. So we asked everybody just to sit down and hold on. And the skipper very skillfully, she lifted up onto a wave and he spun her on the top of the wave and sort of and back we came. But that could have been a lot different. If you go to people on board and they start to panic, it is a bit of an issue. Now we're going up the Bewley River to Buckler's Hard that I mentioned earlier. This is going past a place called Leap. Leap on the New Forest shore. This beach was used for construction of some of the Mulberry Harbors during the war, which were used for the D-Day landings. You see the Coast Guard cottages. Entering the Bewley River, Ali Oliver the skipper. We are arriving at Butler's Heart, and the inlets you see there are the old slipways where the sailing ships were built, warships, men of war. Some photographs of the pool bow coming up the river. It's a beautiful trip. We actually, in the early days, used to charter some of the small boats from Southampton to trips up to Butler's Heart. Chris may have been on one or two of them. Here she's alongside at Butler's Heart. And we had to have some purpose built steps to enable people on a pontoon landing to ascend to the boat. Of course, once you get onto that situation, you have problems again. If anybody's partially disabled, it's not the easiest thing to get them up and down the steps. But they were very, very useful and much needed. And we needed them later in Southampton when we did a lot of charter work. Coastal Cruising Association chartered the boat in the winter. Uh, going around all the unusual places of Pool Harbour. It's alongside Lake Pier, which is in, up near Hamworthy Shore. We're going ashore. And alongside Castle Pier at Bramsey Island. That pier is owned by the National Trust. I phoned them. Uh, sorry, it's owned by John Lewis. I phoned them and they were pleased that we to welcome us. Cold old day. Everybody went ashore for a walk around. And most of the job was dealt with customer relations, dealing with passengers, etc. I tried always to be cheerful. <laughs> tried. <laughs> and a good day at the office. Glorious day. This gentleman on the left is quite a character. It was very, very difficult to recruit people on a seasonal basis. Uh, anybody any good? And uh, this was the say the same for crews as well. Some were excellent, some weren't so excellent, but uh, and the same sort of people. And uh, this chap called Pat. He uh, was a millionaire when well, the time was 28. He had the tire business up in Essex. And after a sort of life of wine, women and song, he was living in a small flat in Boscombe. Things had gone wrong for him. At the height of his, uh, what he'd done, he had a millionaire's house then in Poole. In fact, in Sandbanks, and his wife still lived there with the daughter. But he, obviously things had gone wrong for him. And one day he was telling me he tried to make a fortune out of bringing in champagne uh, for the millennium. Unfortunately, the people he was dealing with were obviously dead dodgy and they spelt millennium wrong on the label. So he didn't really make anything then either. But that's a glorious day. Which you, if you could, you have those days all the time in Bournemouth. And you see the sand is still not an issue. <coughs> we move sadly into some years of decline. That actually, the top photo is taken in the summer. You wouldn't believe it. It's in the summer. You see the fun fed down at the end of the pier and the pier show on. And uh, it, it's just inevitable people were not going to come to places like Bournemouth when they could go somewhere and be assured of sunshine. And you see the swell at the pier as well. The extended high season, traditionally boosted by many thousands from Scotland, drank as the Scottish holidays 
operate at a different time. They break up from school earlier than down here. That drained away to a trickle as Freddie Laker replaced Bournemouth. And uh, who can blame them? And the decline of the Isle of Wight trade. You know, it was people more used to uh, uh, Benidorm or Bali. The promise of an afternoon tea stop at the quaint village of Brystone somehow lost its appeal. And as I said, we used the vintage bus to take people round on tour, which was nice for those who enjoyed it, but it didn't really hit the spot with people. Now these people used to come in and ask, well, what's on brand Sea Island? And I'd say, well, it's a, a nature reserve. You've got bird hides, you've got red squirrels, you've got listed all the things there, nice tea room, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, nothing for the kids, they'd say, and walk off. And I think, well, that's the whole world's changed, I suppose. Anyway, things carried on declining, and we then put both the Dorset Bell and Bournemouth Bell on the market with a view to selling one. We had a few time wasters. One chap wanted to take her to France and various and some one to Ireland, but no genuine buyers forthcoming. And with considerably increased fuel prices, the cost of daily empty steaming between Poole, Bournemouth, and Swanage uh, and return became considerably more in in significant. And the arrival of concessionary bus pass. There's another nail in the old coffin. And uh, I remember Ian McMillan telling me that it affected the Balmoral much the same. He said, if you're living in Penarth and you could go around the Gower Coast on the bus for free, why would you get on the Balmoral for 20 quid to go to Wilfrica? And he was spot on with that. We had exactly the same situation. And the bus service to uh, Swanage developed as well. When I first started, there was well, a single decker every hour here going on the Sandbanks Ferry. And then it developed an open decker running twice an hour. And now there's new buses with a capacity each of 96 passengers serve Swanage up to four times an hour in high summer. And we're all guilty. We hop on it as often as we can. Why pay a ton to go any other way when you go for free? And uh, you know, that, that served its purpose there, really. And it's a lovely ride. It's, it's voted the second most beautiful bus ride in the country after the one that runs through the Yorkshire Dales. Refits were no longer feasible at Poole. Uh, all work now had to be undertaken at Southampton. That incurred greater expense, getting there, getting the tools there, and wharfage was more expensive there, coupled with relocation costs for staff and a lot of wasted travel time. The actual net hours of work up there were rather limited. We always had a, a few issues at the Isle of Wight. Coming back from the Isle of Wight, if the weather was bad, we had a few problems from time to time. And if it was really bad, we used to make for Limington and a shelter in Limington, which the, the railway people were very accommodating, very helpful. And as two occasions come to mind, on one, we uh, moved to Limington and my general manager, Mark Cox, who you've seen, went band on the train to meet everybody. And he put them, is was, was anybody familiar with Limington? It's a short uh, line, branch line, runs down from Brockenhurst, which is the main uh, London Bournemouth line. And he got all these people on the train to go up to Brockenhurst. And he asked the conductor in those days operated with a hand ticket machine for 127 singles to Bournemouth. And of course, the bloke nearly collapsed. He couldn't do it. And he said, oh, you'll have to do it when you get there. So there was no chance when they train, changed trains at Brockenhurst, there was no chance to get there, get the tickets. Uh, so Mark went to the office in Bournemouth, held his hands up and said what had happened. They took notes and said, oh, we'll have to send you an invoice. But fortunate for us, we never received the invoice. It was obviously just too much trouble. On another occasion, very briefly, we were with the Waverley. It was at Yarmouth. And I'm not sure who, I think it might have been Graham Galatly phoned me and said, oh, we're not coming back to Bournemouth. We need coaches. We're going to repatriate everybody from Yarmouth over to Lymington. But he said, your bloke, Ali, is going to have a go at it. So I said, oh, fine. Anyway, half an hour later, Ali phoned. He said, it's management sees out here. I'm making for Lymington as well. So he was going to Lymington. The Waverley passengers were all going to Lymington. I'm not sure whether actually had they spread over two ferries to Lymington because there were so many of them, but a memory plays tricks with you. So we, my lady in the office was phoning around trying to get coaches, as of course Jim was on the Waverley. And Mark and I went round to Lymington and we we're greeted by a sea of baying people. who are all sort of, where are we going? What are we doing? Expecting coaches to be there on the spot. Eventually coaches did arrive. 
and we agreed that we just load people, didn't matter which who they were for. Us. People were born within this coach, people were born in that Swanage. Waverley had passengers for Weymouth as well, so we did all that. And inevitably, of course, everybody was getting the wrong coaches, and all the coaches had to uh, had to go to all the places. So some people didn't get back home until very late that night. But it's nobody's fault. We don't sail on a bad, didn't sail on a bad tide, a bad uh, forecast. But in the afternoons, the weather could turn, and you have wind over tide. It could be lethal coming across Christchurch Ledge. The late Nick Hopkins, he was the last dedicated peer master at Bournemouth. Very smart, always in his uniform. In his last couple of years, they made him wear blue shorts and look trendy, and it didn't suit the bill. And uh, his understanding of the weather and the sea conditions was always invaluable. They replaced him when he retired by a student girl. She looked good in shorts, but knew little, and she spent most of her time twinkling on the phone. And that unfortunately reflects, to my view, a lot of the uh, demise of the place as well. And they, they could look up to Nick, he knew he was in charge, well, he said went, but they, that's gone. No shortage of high profile advertising outlets. Uh, a university study revealed daily passing footfall to be 38,000 in high summer. I'm not to argue, but I know on a busy day it could be a sea of people out there. And our office overlooked these weather, so it was uh, very successful. As I mentioned, we all worked together with the Waverley. Here's the Bournemouth Bell, having brought some people over from Swanage to join the Waverley. When the Swanage Pier was close to the Waverley, she's off back to Swanage and the Waverley's off on one of her travels. I became agent for the Waverley, the South Coast agent, and it is sort of once or twice it had its moments, but it uh, generally worked very well. And uh, one of the things it, oh, I'll refer to it. Okay. Okay. Bournemouth Bell, sorry, the pool bell coming in with Waverley alongside On the other side of the pier, the west side, over there. At first, not been used for a long time, by the way, the west side of the pier has been out of action for quite a few years now. Ah, we must forget, of course, the consort, the Balmoral, is seen going into Swanage Pier. This is before Swanage Pier was rebuilt. This is one of Chris Phillips' excellent photographs from Swanage. And you see Swanage Pier is still awaiting restoration and uh, looks very run down there on the end. But in fact, uh, now it's absolutely beautiful. Ian McMillan and Ken Angel on board the old Balmoral, one of their old engines, the Sirens. I had a great deal of time for Ian, a very hard working man. And we, he used to phone me and the call would often last half an hour, interrupt when he went into a tunnel. He usually phoned me when he was on the train. And uh, we, we discussed lots and lots of issues. And uh, one day he, he asked me if I could look at the possibility of uh, the feasibility of a Balmoral timetable based on the south coast and based in, in the Solent primarily to start with. And I spent a lot of time doing this, which was all based upon pre book parties, charters, and things because the pickup in the Solent is very low for casuals. And the beauty of it was, of course, the, the crew could get off every night. The thought was perhaps you could. Uh, stay in cows overnight. The crew would go home. You'd have none of this empty steaming. You could you could operate every day, and um, of course you could run at all states of the tide. And uh, by taking on all the major events like the round of island yacht race, the pool talkie, uh, uh, speedboat race, powerboat race, cows week, cows fireworks, Bournemouth regatta, these sort of things, it, we may or may not have worked. I don't know. Anyway, having spent a lot of time on this and doing all the costings on it, even phoned the AA and got a potential charter from them, the AA at Basingstoke, 
I was asked to take all this information to Glasgow and those in the office just sort of looked at it and consigned it to the bin. So sadly, that was that. Anyway, uh, when the inn came down one day, he said to when Swanage Pier was out of action, he, he phoned me and he said, um, I'm coming down on uh, whatever day it was. Ron Sims would like to come down, our engineer, Ron Sims and I would be with you about 10 o'clock or 10.30. Uh, can we go to Swanage? I said, yes. I phoned Swanage Pier Master, Russ Johnson, very welcoming. Anyway, day went on, the day went on, no sign of Ian. Uh, at four o'clock he arrived, and this is a bit typical Ian, he trying to do three things in one day when you can only possibly do one. So I phoned Russ, who was just about locking up to go home. And he said, oh yes, he said, oh, hang on. So off we went. And of course, if you're going to Swanage, involves going on the uh, Sandbanks Shell Bay car ferry. And uh, once we got on board, Ian insisted on getting out the car with Ron and going up to the cabin, the drive cabin, and seeing what was going on. And I said, we're only on here for a few minutes. It's literally a four minute crossing. Off they went. And of course, they hadn't come back by the time the boat, had re the ferry reached the other bank. Uh, so I had to drive off. You can't to park there because they're really moving off and they're moving on. Anyway, Ron Sims ran down and jumped in, but jumped in the wrong car. And some woman greeted him with a loud shriek. <laughs> anyway, he explained the scenario and uh, there was no further action taken. But I had to park up the road and they eventually came. Anyway, having been there, Ian said, oh, you've got to join the peer friends and try and make some influence uh, to get these, this piling sorted out. He so said, we'll help you with the piling. We've got a lot of contacts with that, but we've got to get things moving. And this I duly did. This is where I met Frank Snart and uh, we developed a good working relationship at Swanage and a close friendship ever since. Is uh, Swanage undergoing some repiling? And the ceremonial last tap of the pile, that's Russ Johnson, the uh, then peer master, uh, as the last pile went in for that particular test, will enable the pier to reopen and here's the baby coming alongside. Swanage Pier today, very beautiful place, let's say, if you're in Swanage, it's worth a visit, and it's the pier is an absolute delight. Here we see the Bell Moral in Yarmouth. Take it from one of the white big ferries. She's just letting go, horror him. View of the Balmoral alongside at Yarmouth embarking passengers. Yarmouth's a very nice pier, being restored, and I hope you will be there to serve us for many years to come. It's become increasingly popular when the Waverley comes down. And what could be better than batting across Pool Bay on a glorious summer's day? Marketing at the office, we were at the pier entrance, I said, you're attending to Bournemouth Council, and we had plenty of advertising, but uh, if you take a horse to water, we can't make them drink. We can't make enough of them drink. Great supporter of both the Waverley and the Bells. The late Patrick Taylor contemplates his next outing. Very good man, lovely man. Used to come every year, year after year after year. Spend a week on the Bells and a week on the Waverley. Very nice job. And Paul Bell setting, to, setting off to sea. The landward berth remained accessible in this 2003 image. Note the level of sand and the still vibrant pier theatre. Still it shows on that theatre. There's the traditional speedboat that used to operate from the pier and the pool bow and of course the Waverley on a glassy sea. If only we could see a few more of those. The Flamboyant wasn't a success at pool, so we had to go down at Weymouth and she was taken over by uh, ex Waverley Master Peter Tambling. He offered, operated the ship in Weymouth. And we ran it on the sort of traditional basis, old fashioned type advertising, and tried to make something because she was a registered historic ship. 
built in 1938. Made a lot of improvements on there, improved the toilets, the bar, uh, made it watertight, but so the, the decks used to leak a bit, and uh, general improvements, but the numbers attractive weren't adequate to uh, make it pay. And the final nail in the coffin was the MCA uh, had me in the office, which we used to go over here and have a chat with them. And he said, well, next year we want to do this, 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 lift the deck. And I thought, oh my God, well, you're talking about tens of thousands. That was the point where you, you know, we spend a bit, but we're not going to spend any more. Issues coming along past Lowworth Cove or near Lowworth Cove. And Peter Townding on board, his with his blue ensign, flying as you would do, proudly flying there. And Flamborin at large, here she's coming to Hyde Pier in Southampton Water. When you take a boat away from base, you have all sorts of challenges. You A, you've got to find a berth somewhere that's A, suitable, B, has car park nearby, C, doesn't, isn't affected by the swell from other passing ships, it's secure, etc., etc. You also have to arrange for pilotage. Supplies catering in a, in a place you've not been to. If you've got groups on board, you have to have catering arranged. A hell of a lot of work goes into this, and uh, it, it pays dividends if it works. Most times it did occasionally we have a little hiccup. And so the flower, if everybody's never been to Hyde Pier, that's Hyde Pier. It's gone through some very sad times. I'm pleased to say there's a group there now striving to restore it to its former glory. It's got the world's oldest uh, pier railway there. So the, the train came over. Uh, World War One gas uh, shell factory, and if you if you're ever there, it's certainly worth a visit. And there's a flambeur in the pool bell alongside. In fact, this is one of the berths you wouldn't go back to because uh, when I went to look at it with Mark, it was fine. But what we didn't appreciate every time a red jet, a red funnel steamer's red jet going past, the swell was quite excessive, and it ranged against the pier and threw the bar contents around and made it very uncomfortable to crew who were aboard. Here she is going up the Solent with one of the red. I'm not to have a look to tell you which one that is, if I can, which I can't. <laughs> anyway, one of the red, red funnel ferries going up through there. And that's the flambore and just arriving. We found a good breath in Southampton. We used to be in the old Camper and Nicholson shipyard up high up on the River Itchen towards Northern Bridge. And uh, it's called Saxon Wharf. And here we see the Bournemouth Bell alongside and the pool bell following in to go alongside as well for some charter work. Now, one of my moments of madness, uh, we were the BP Global Challenge in the Solent was a major event and uh, all our boats were chartered as was I think everything else actually that floated. And the BP operation in Pool Harbour wanted to charter the boat uh, we didn't have anything, and in a moment of madness, I found uh, Sandy Armstrong, who operated the Western Lady Cruises on the Torquay Brixham run. And I said to her, Any chance we could charter one of the boats bring to Southampton to operate a, a cruise for the BT Global Challenge? I said, Why don't you be good enough to fire that across to Mr. Perrot's bags? Mr. Perrot, pardon me, and his son were the owners of the ships. Quite amazingly, they took the bait, and two hours later, she found, oh, yes, we could do that. We'd love to do that. Well, this is probably my biggest gamble because they would bring an open boat up the coast from Torquay to go to Southampton. If it poured with rain that day, it was a very expensive charter. If it poured that day, I'm sure that people with the charterers wouldn't want to sit down in the rain all day. But anyway, that we duly did. And in fact, the ship came up on a, it was the Western Lady 4 we had, and she came up on glassy seas. It was beautiful coming up the, up the coast. And thinking back to my childhood and the fair miles that used to call it Bournemouth, I asked if she'd come into Bournemouth Pier, which they were delighted to do so. Anyway, they phoned the office or radioed the office and said, we're half an hour from the pier. So a few of us wandered down the pier to have a look. And we waited and we waited. By this time, there was a bit of fog appearing. It was getting mystery and mystery. And then I had a phone call, oh, we're alongside the pier. Well, the fact they're alongside the wrong pier, they're alongside Boscombe Pier, and that didn't bode well uh, because I think they had radar issues which uh, manifested themselves the following day. But anyway, then they came in and fine, and here we see the some of the beach staff. 
these two gents in uniform beach inspectors, and you see how smart they were, and the other two lads are lifeguards. And a number of people came to have a look at this lovely craft, and she is very lovely. And uh, before they set off up to Southampton, here she's going up through the Solent, taken from the Waverley, looking good. And alongside in Southampton, in the ocean dock, as it was after the ocean terminal had been demolished. Very smart, the, the boats were always beautifully maintained, credit to all the team down in Torquay. And here she is in the Solent. Uh, they'd never seen traffic like it. Uh, Sandy said to me that uh, Torquay would have four yachts, down here you've got 4,000. And then you had to weave your way through all the boats. How surprising who you see, the way you're just about to chew up some Johnny in a little, <laughs> little boat. That's so the Waverley was there as well. I'm sorry the photograph's a bit grainy, but it's the only one we have. And the Dorset Bell was also on charter the same day, and she's here seen going up into the Lymington River. She was chartered from Lymington. And on this occasion, uh, a yachty swung round to starboard, went straight into the side of her, slammed the side and damaged his yacht and everything, then went on to blame the skipper of the Dorset Bell. Luckily, somebody on the bridge was filming the event. <laughs> So uh, this was sent to his solicitors and we heard nothing further. Another event in the Solent with the uh, QE2, of course, and this time the Bournemouth Bell. Uh, another crazy scheme, 2003 Boxing Day. It was announced that the new Queen Mary II was coming into Southampton in the morning, very early. And I thought, well, we'll have a go at this. And uh, what happened, we sent the boat up before Christmas and brought the crew back, she's laid up at Saxon Wharf. And uh, it involved leaving Southampton on the Bournemouth on the coach at half past four in the morning because the Queen Mary was due off Cal Shot at half past six. And amazingly, we sold out, we sold 120 odd tickets, three, three coaches we had, because that's the number we could comfortably accommodate in the saloon if the weather were inclement. But in fact, the weather was glorious. It was cold and crisp, but misty. And we set off from Bournemouth, uh, from uh, Saxon Wharf around half past five, made our way down, down the Solent. As we approached Cowshot Spit, we saw this great blaze of lights coming around the Brambles Bank as she swung off cows uh, heading into Southampton. And, and I have to say, of the 120 people, 120 were out on back in the cold and blowing it. And we followed up with her, and it was a very successful and unusual occurrence. Again, dependent upon the weather, and things went well for us. And the Bournemouth Bell back up in Southampton again. We had two boats up there for the occasion of the handing over the keys of the Atlantic from the QE2 to the Queen Mary 2. A big event in Southampton, lots of uh, fireworks in the evening, and uh, it was uh, a very memorable occasion. Then we used to, when the pier was silting up very badly and we had difficulty. The boats used to dig a tra trench down the side of the pier as they went in and out, but even this was inadequate. And so what we had to do in lunch times, we'd run the, one of the boats with their engines at full tilt and gradually warp it down the pier to blast the sand out of the way so we could carry on using the berth. Well, this of course wasn't very satisfactory, so we borrowed this dredger, the Petrop, and she was uh, to fill her, I had to fill her up with water to hold the stern down to give you any chance of driving the sand away. Well, because it's so shallow, the propellers kept lifting off the seabed. And we were blasting away at the sand, and a chap and his young son came down. And he asked me, Excuse me, he said, Is this the boat to Swanage? <laughs> I think he probably thought I had a swimming pool or something. I don't know. Um, but there we are. And then, unfortunately, peer maintenance deteriorated at Bournemouth. Bournemouth used to have a, a maintenance gang. A shore gang used to come along, do all the work. You phone them up in the morning if there was a problem. By lunchtime, there'd be somebody there sorting it out. One of the facing piles would come off, as is the case here. And then, of course, they had nobody, and it was always went back to private uh, work. And you didn't get the job A done so quickly or B so efficiently. They, the council had their own pile driver at one time, it was in fact built in their own workshops. And it was kept on the pier. And I was always encouraged every autumn on the pile driver arrived, well, that's good, they're going to do some more pilot. Uh, but this had to be uh, withdrawn. It was deemed to be, because of health and safety, it was said to be too noisy. So it was taken away. So after that, the great expense of bringing in a jack-up barge was encountered for any further piling. 
Here you see a couple of very dangerous bolts hanging at the pier when one of the facing piles had been washed away in a storm or knocked away. I said to you before we linked up with the shockwave jet boat. This is a remarkable boat and you could sell tickets for this all day long and we did. Uh, very successful and in the mornings we used to, we linked up with a couple of the English language schools and bring two or three hundred students around from a pool on the boat and then they'd all quietly sit on the pier and enjoy the morning and have to have turns and have a spin round on the shockwave all for one price but the money we took paid for the fuel for the day on all the boats so it was it was very good and the bonus for the shockwave because she could start early morning when they weren't very busy anyway and by the time it got busy in the afternoon she was um, available one very interesting case for the shockwave went out one day uh, a group of gentlemen who are sort of from asian persuasion from memory they phoned me and asked could they charter the shockwave for a slightly extended cruise i said we're able to do that we arranged a fee and off they went uh, 15 minutes later i had a phone call from the skipper of the shockwave oh sorry we've had a hive too there's a body out here i said oh my goodness um, I said, well, stand by, where are we? He said, we're a mile and a half south, uh, southwest of the Bournemouth Pier. I said, well, stand by, I'll get the police. So I went the police and we went through to the police at Poole, the Marine Police, and they said, oh, we can't do anything about that. Our boat's at the water being refitted. Can he bring the body to, to Bournemouth Pier? I said, no, he can't do that. He's got 12 people on board. And then anyway, I spoke to the skipper. He said, well, the body's a bit decaying. It's a bit messy. And he said, can you hurry up? He said, these Asians have been seasick. He said, they're pleading to be taken back. I said, oh, I'm very sorry, the police haven't got a boat. Anyway, cut a long story short, the police managed to charter a fishing boat or something and made their way around and recovered the body. But um, it's one of those jobs that when you went down the pier, you never knew what you were going to find on any morning or afternoon. So the most unexpected things occurred. On one case, we went to Brown Sea Island and we had a coach party from Luton of uh, slightly disadvantaged children, in fact they were adolescents, and their carers, they came down and uh, went to Brown Sea Island, when the boat came back, uh, they did a head count, and one of the carers' uh, children hadn't come back. And I was horrified, I said, what do you mean? And the, the woman had obviously been drinking as well, which wasn't a good thing. So anyway, I phoned Brown Sea Island, Brown Sea Island was just about to close up for the night, they uh, got in touch with the Royal Marines at Hamworthy, who sent parties of people over searching and eventually found this boy, brought him back. And the woman's coach, of course, had gone back to Luton. So I had to fork out 140 quid to give the taxi driver to take these two back to Luton. But thankfully, the school or whatever it was, the organization did refund me. But uh, it's one of those things. And we had two bad charters. Two of the most unlikely things. Charters generally went very well, working men's clubs, parties, this sort of thing, families, 21st birthdays, excellent. And we chartered it, the boat one night to a very well known public school, girls' public school near Bournemouth. And uh, of course, very careful who you serve drinks to, what you're doing that. And the barman phoned me up and said, uh, Pete, we've got a bit of a problem here. Some of these girls are drunk. I said, What? He said, yeah, we haven't sold any girls. Then they realized the teachers were buying drinks and feeding them to the girls. And they uh, called the boat back immediately. And the following day, we contacted the uh, school. Uh, they were very uh, furious, in fact, because we could have lost our license and everything. And the headmistress was absolutely appalled and said she was going to take action to deal with it. But we didn't ever use them again. And the other people who acted uh, weren't, weren't the lifeguards, I don't think. The lifeguards chartered the boat and had a lot of all young people on there and they clearly weren't eating Smarties. And they were dancing all on top of the bridge and everything. So we had to curtail that charter as well. But most of them went very well. Here we see the Western Lady. And this is taken uh, later. This is Western Lady 3, a consortium in Swanage. When uh, she was withdrawn from service down in Torquay, they took the bold step of buying her and operated her for a couple of years from Swanage. <laughs> the impression of speed I referred to earlier.
Now we're back to Bournemouth Pier, shows the critical situation with the sand uh, building up around the pier and we can no longer use the inner berths. And that's the speedboat berth at low tide, so it just shows how bad things have become. And deterioration of the pier. Surprisingly, that's the west side. Surprisingly, the council embarked on a major rebuild of the east side in 2010, including the shoreward berth, which we could never use anyway. And then one day I had a phone call from the owner of Parkstone Bay Marina, whom I knew, Stuart Rawlinson. And he said, he's very interested in developing services. He would like to talk to me about buying the business. And I thought, blimey, Christmas has arrived. <laughs> and anyway, cut a long story short, he duly did. And uh, he said, oh, you can work for me as long as you want to, to do the same job. So I ran the same job for him for a couple of years without quite so much stress. And unfortunately, they took it on and they ran the shop well and the advertising was, was poor and it, it's no disrespect to them. They were very busy with their marina uh, and perhaps this was a square peg in a round hole, really. But uh, he sold the, put the, the um, boats on, which I'll show you in a minute. Best day of my life was retirement, one of the best days. And the, the Bournemouth Bell, she left for Guernsey on the 11th of August 2011. Never to return. She went on charter because the Guernsey South boat had broken down, major collapse. She sailed off to Guernsey, such a success, they put in an offer and bought her. And she's still there today, although she's now been uh, uh, replaced by a larger, faster boat, but I'm not sure what's going to happen to her. Blue Line Cruises, this time with Kevin Waters, whom I mentioned earlier, who joined us to start with. He'd run in Blue Line Cruises and he tended for, <coughs> to run the service from Bournemouth Pier. Very difficult to come in. If you, those of you in Scotland remote recognize the old Loch Moor, renamed Jurassic Scene, but the sand is kicking up and the shallow conditions, it didn't help at all. Very difficult. Here she is alongside Bournemouth. She was never really comfortable there, I didn't think, but uh, she ran for a couple of years as a little film of her. <laughs> And here she is on one of rare visits to Yarmouth. That's a beautiful photograph of her, I think. Kick, kicking along a nice bow wave. And Blue Line, they had all the same problems that we did. Uh, they packed up in 2013, mid, midway through the season. And in 2014, the council woke up. Oh, we haven't got any boats. Oh, what's happened to the pier? All too late, I'm afraid. Great shame. I just put this in a couple of things. It's the uh, Empress Queen, which was at that time the largest boat uh, to call it Bournemouth Pier. Again, Bournemouth wasn't suited for her, but of course she couldn't go cross channel. And she remained the largest boat to call it the pier until, uh, amazing, I saw this sand dredger, which was then pumping sand onto the beach. And she was actually tied up alongside the pier, so she, uh, I hope she didn't do too much damage. Pastures new, very quickly, we'll run through where the boats are today. The pool bell, now the fourth bell, running up a uh, beautiful trips to Inchcombe. I've done the cruises on there, very lovely. And tendering visiting liners. Here she is at Inchcomb Island, highly recommended if you're up that way. Uh, here she is with the Boudicca, to Fred Olsen liner leaving for the last time on her way to Turkey. I believe she's a hotel or accommodation ship. The Bournemouth Bell is still over in Sark, as we mentioned. She's been refitted in 2014. 
and on service between Guernsey and Sark. The last to go was the Dorset Bell after the 2012 season saving from Paul. She went to uh, the Bristol Channel into Cardiff and became known as the Dame Shirley. I've often thought that Shirley, <laughs> Dame Shirley wouldn't have been best pleased with being having a battered old boat named after her, but there we are. Sailing through the Cardiff Barrage out to sea. And then a chap called Dave Wilkie came along and he purchased her, operating and moved her to the Isle of Sheppey and renamed her the Spirit of Sheppey. The passenger loadings, I believe, were a little disappointing. There were one or two challenging operational bits of business there. Amazingly, he went back at the end of last year, renamed the Dorset Bell again. Here she comes again. Here she is alongside Swanage Pier. Uh, there's one small berth you can use at Bournemouth Pier on the uh, seaward end of the east side, which is was maintained fairly well for visiting craft during the Bournemouth Air Show. Here we see the 1948 Bournemouth Bell moved along the coast and was renamed Weymouth Bell, for which a young John McGoran served. And she's now the delightful suitor's lass. Again, if you're ever up that way, it's an absolute treat to go on her. 1948, pool built, wooden boat, immaculate. Then amazingly, this uh, picture was re recently sent me and it's taken in Newcastle and we see the Flamborian and the old pool bell. They were both there for tall ships charter. The Flamborian gone north from uh, Bridlington and uh, the pool bell was then on the Cromarty service. New at Bournemouth Pier, zip wire, pound a second it costs you on that zip wire. Yet, uh, and what would our forefathers have made of all this? Well, I don't know. Progress, I suppose. If you still, if you're in Bournemouth, go around to Wareham, have a little trip on the Monarch. Delightful little Monarch. I understand that she is up for sale, owing to the owner's health concerns, and there's interest from Manchester for operation of the Manchester Ship Canal, which would be rather nice if you can. And down the bottom right is the Wareham Queen, which was the last paddle steamer to operate on the river. Waverley at Pool, an evening arrival. Look at the crowds. Like me, everybody wants to go to Pool with Waverley. We all look at it perhaps a little bit through rose tinted spectacles. It's not like running in and out of the pier. And here's a short view. This is the PSPS Charter, the Wessex Branch Charter in 2009, showing the Waverley departure from Pool. <coughs> I was principally involved with organising this, and so I didn't go on it. So I thought if things go wrong, you need to be assured to try and sort them out. And just as well, because the boat went to Southampton, and when I arrived at Southampton, the to go in, um, the policeman on charge said, uh, Oh, you're a lot of your people here early. And I found they'd uh, arrived. It was two group of coaches of, from a gardening club, and they. <laughs> In the Thames area, and they'd arrived early. The coaches had gone off, there was nowhere to sit, and they were sat with their legs dangling over the side of the key wall, these old people. And of course, I went potty. So, how we weren't picked up on the CCTV, I do not know. But of course, that was breaking all the regulations and rules, but they were quite right, there was nowhere to sit, and the coaches shouldn't have done. Crews didn't go entirely to plan, they were due to come back to the pool in the evening, but the skipper, Captain O'Brien, didn't want to come back in again. And uh, it was a bit of a fiasco, really. A lot of the people who booked to go from Southampton to Paul, with Paul being the highlight, had to get out from Bournemouth in the drizzle, and their coaches were in Paul. So, a few nightmares there. There's, there's Jim McMagin. Swinging here with the Herbert Ballon as the pool tug, making a bow strain. She looks wonderful coming in and out of pool. She advertises herself alongside the quayside, all that way, but it's a, I say, it's a little bit of a palaver getting around. I 
hopefully we'll see her there again this year. Anyway, that's just about it. A couple more slides to follow up for this, but I'd like to thank you all very much for your, uh, coming along and attending this uh, little presentation. Hope you found it interesting. Now, I work, spend a lot of my time in Camper Cliffs Library, which is home of the Paul Maritime Trust. We also serve as custodians of the Coastal Cruising Association archive. If you're ever that way, visitors and new volunteers are always welcome. Chris Wood of Bournemouth, who's a long-serving PSPS member, is engaged upon compiling a book dealing with the history of the Dorset Coast Pleasure Boats. If you'd like to receive more information with respect to this publication relating to the Pool Maritime Trust, or in fact pose a question to the presenter, contact email will be displayed at the end of this. I'd like to briefly thank the following for imagery and input. I'm not a great photographer. Sandy Armstrong Bullis, Richard Turner, Ian Boyle, Sue Whitten, Tom Lee, Chris Wood, Frank Snart, David Cousins, Robert Whitelaw, John McGoran, Chris Phillips of Swanage, the Coastal Cruising Association Archives, the Lake Bernard Cox Collection, Paul Maritime Trust Archive, and my apologies to anybody whom I might have forgotten. That's what I do now. I spend a lot of time there looking at old photographs. That's what old fogies do, I suppose. And thank you very much for coming aboard. Thanks very much, uh, Peter. Well, um, I hope everyone enjoyed that talk. Um, very happy summer days. Well, most of it was anyway, but uh, not without its trials and tribulations. Um, I could begin to see, Peter, why you're now retired. What with coastal cruising, the PSPS, Swanage Pier, pool histo history. Um, no wonder Nora wants you at home and I don't blame her. So well done, Peter. Thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Um, I must say that uh, anybody who knows me knows me as the Jurassic Coast dinosaur. So well done for coping with all the technicalities. It's all well beyond me. So hopefully uh, everybody can still hear me. Um, Peter and everybody that's listening, um, all I can hope is that uh, they keep telling us there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Well, I just hope it's still shining. And uh, it did occur to me during your talk, Peter, that uh, nobody is going to want to go abroad too much. So let's hope they all come down to the coast. And if we're able to take passengers on whatever ship it may be, then hopefully we might have a good summer yet. Um, as you said, Peter, I think your email address is going to be on the screen at the end. Um, thank you once again. And uh, at this point, normally I say to people, I wish them uh, a safe journey home. Well, that won't be necessary because as far as I know, we're all at home. So uh, all I can say is stay safe and uh, keep well and uh, let's hope for better things to come. Thank you very much. <laughs>